Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. For sure. I really appreciate you coming to the uh, the panel I hosted three or four weeks ago, just talking about excellence in sales. And I feel like you, out of all the panelists, had the, the best tactical takeaways in terms of your sales process and just like professionalism, how to come off as a professional the, the way you want to. So I appreciate you hopping in on that and sharing your practices with uh, the community. Yeah, I mean, thanks. Um, yeah, I love to uh, speak on sales and what I do. So it's cool to, you know, put that out there a little bit. My girlfriend doesn't really like to talk work. So whenever I get the yeah. chance, I, uh, you know, I eat that stuff up, you know? Yeah, I think the goal is to like do something that you enjoy. And it sounds cheesy or whatever, but if you can truly do that, you know, it just makes going to work on Monday morning that much easier. So I'm oh, lucky yeah. to, to be in that seat. And, and it sounds like you are too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, I definitely want to elaborate on it. I mean, that's, uh, got a lot of friends that, you know, never talk work and next thing you know, they're complaining about it. So like, you know, the only time they talk about work is when they're complaining and then, I mean, I'm not going to tell them to go look for a new job, but you know, if you don't love what you're doing and you don't like to talk about it, you don't like to learn about it, then, you know, what are we doing? You know? Yeah, exactly. It, you know, there's so much to do out there. If you hate what you're, if you hate every day of your life, like, man, like it's hard for me to imagine what that must be like, but um, anyway, this is a podcast about work motivations, work styles, you know, generally I try to start with like who you are and where you came from, like what got you to this point. And then generally at the end of this, it's kind of cool. We can like suss out truth between each other and talk about meaning and that kind of thing. So if that's cool with you, uh, I wanted to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's dive into that. Cool, man. So I know you played baseball in, in college and, uh, before that, I didn't ask you anything about that on the live panel, but was curious more about sports. I played basketball, AAU. Um, it taught me a lot about just discipline, persistence, you know, hitting the gym every day, but curious about you and in, in the baseball career and, you know, kind of what you brought into your sales career with, with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me just back up. I mean, I think sports in general is just the perfect analogy for life, um, you know, and, and you learn a lot of cool things, you know, from different, you know, coaches, uh, mentors, teammates, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, um, what some of the things that I've learned, I, there's, there's one thing that my college coach told me has a little ring to it. It was be on time and do things right. That, those are the only two rules that we had. And, you know, don't break them. Um, we didn't have curfew. Um, no one was checking in to make sure that you are going to your weights on time or, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going out the night before. So, you know, it really held you, held you accountable, um, and, and empowered you, but it was one of those things where, you know, what's right and what's wrong, you know, should you be doing this? Is this going to make you better or worse? Right. Um, so that was one thing that I got in college and then in pro ball, Man, um, I was so used to having a regiment, you know, it's like, hey, here's here's some weights, here's your study all, here's your classes, here's what time you need to be at everything. When I got to the minor leagues, um, there's a time to go to practice, but there wasn't a time to do go to weights. There wasn't a time to do the extra bullpen or do anything outside of what is just structured, you know, at your facility. Um, so I was kind of lost because, you know, like I said, in college, they have you kind of lined up, you know, with a nice tight regiment on what to do and what to do, where to be, where, where you need to be. Um, and so I just remember watching some of these, you know, uh, professionals that are in the big leagues. They were on a routine um, from the moment that they walked into the facility to the moment they left. They were doing the same thing over and over and over. And I remember uh, talking to one of them. And he goes, man, it's when you're a professional, you, you, you have to have a routine. Um, and you know how sports are um, being very uh, um, superstitious, you know, having having your way. And I think some of it was a part of that. Um, but if you strip down the superstitions that they had, they were doing the same thing over and over. And so I think that's really what took me or what I took from pro ball to what I'm doing today. And I think that goes to what you said, being disciplined, um, you know, having that motivation and, and, you know, just having that drive and having that work ethic. And I think that's something that I, I gained from playing ball. Yeah. One thing I had a question on was your college coach saying, do things right. I think as we all get older and just think about 
what is doing it right in terms of working in sales or accounting or if you're a doctor, right? Like there's kind of like, there's a playbook generally for what you think is right. But um, I do think that it matters ethically with the person and also their ability to structure their time and hold themselves accountable, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, that doing things right is to not do certain things on the weekend, you know, when you're on scholarship for baseball, you know, that doing things right is showing up on time. Right. But like, um, I guess I'm just curious more about that. And if you think there's any, anything to, to go deeper on and, and the subjectivity of doing things right. Yeah. And more. Of, so I'll talk about it in just like an everyday life. Um, it's, it's, you know, I'll just be kind of very simplistic about it. Um, I mean, how many times have you, you know, just gone to the, you know, get up from your desk, go to the bathroom and there's just, there's a piece of trash there. Um, and you just walk by it, <laughs> you know, right? It's like, oh, I'll get that later. That's right? so funny, dude. Like, <laughs> um, pick it up in the trash, or you know, or if you dropped it in a restaurant and you, know, you walk to the restaurant, you see it there, pick it up, put it in the trash. And I think that's, you know, doing things right, <laughs> you know, like just do, do the right thing. Um, and then back to, and then just like my professional life, when I'm talking to, uh, you know, just business leaders. Um, just being respectful, right? Um, you know, not trying to be a, a know-it-all and, and telling them what they're doing is wrong, um, you know, or, or just showing up five minutes early, you know, to your to your meeting with them. Um, I think those are just doing the right things. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking notes, you know, listening, um, just being respectful. I, I think that's those are just all the things of just doing it right. Yeah, I had a mentor once say, you know, Nick, you can do a lot of things um certain ways but you got to do two things and one of those is treat people well and be on time and it's funny and this is like my main mentor in my life and it's funny how that like you know i even this week i i tend to join zoom meetings three minutes late sometimes um i guess you i say I feel terrible right you know you're like yeah. oh my gosh i'm so late <laughs> but, and most people are like it's fine but it's more like if i don't have any if, it, if i'm not literally coming off a meeting like is do i really need to be three minutes late like just yeah. respect people enough to be on time um yeah i got into the habit of being one minute late oh it's all good then i'm like oh two minutes late it's it, it's like don't let yourself slide you know just like i wouldn't want because sometimes i'll get on these calls too and like people have to redo the introduction just like that's all that's on me right so it's like all right. So it's almost like holding myself accountable, being kind to myself, but also recognizing I can, I, I have the ability to do things right in a, in a, just a little bit better way. Right. So that's, that's yeah. an idea. Always. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, you just said it yourself when you're talking, like when you wake up, you know, are you going to sleep in just a little bit more? And the next thing you know, you do that for a week and you slept in now it's accumulated. It's compounded over time that you, you slept in and now you've been sleeping in for an extra 30 minutes you know, Mm -hmm. on average now, you know, when you just need to get up, go to the gym, make your breakfast, whatever you got to do in the morning, just do it. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. Most people I come on that, I bring in the podcast. I'm like, Hey, what do you think about motivation? Yada, yada. And three or four people are brought up. This is the 22nd episode. Now the, um, the general who wrote the book about making your bed, it's like in the morning, make your bed. I can't say that I'm always the best at that, but I do know that when I start the morning, with um doing something right okay so i'm gonna be super nice to the, to the cashier it looks like she's having a bad day right like it just makes me feel like there's momentum to my day right like i, oh, I yeah. did that interaction right you know what i mean yeah yeah dude i definitely want to talk about momentum man there's definitely i don't know if it's just been you know just top of mind but i've been hearing a lot of people talk about momentum yeah you know, get that going um uh, and you know, I'll let you, we can talk more about that, yeah. but I think, I think momentum is, is key in everything that you do. Yeah. In positive or negative. Right. But obviously you want to have a positive, positive momentum going, but mm-hmm. yeah. No, we can get into that. I mean, I don't have an agenda for the conversation, but <laughs> as thinking about momentum, like I think about in that moment, I'm doing that, right? Like some people say, I'm like, how do you focus? How do you focus your time? A lot of people out of these 20 conversations say I structure, you know, the most important stuff. And I do that at a certain time of day or, you know, I, some people say I do the smallest stuff first and I get some quick wins. I'm actually still trying to suss that out for myself. Sometimes yeah. like I, for instance, my manager now, he's all about like doing the biggest stuff and making sure you do that perfectly. And sometimes it's hard for me to start that 
until I know that I can, that I can be successful with smaller stuff. And a lot of it is like self-motivation. Like I'm new to the role. Um, but that's a situation where I actually thrive on momentum. Like once I get going, I can tackle the harder, more tedious subject a lot easier than just jumping right into it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I find that interesting because, you know, if you open up a textbook and you jump to the last chapter, um, you know, like any school book, whatever, or like you're, you're building something from Ikea, you know, and you go to the last chapter or the last page and it's all built, you have no idea how to put that together. So why would you start with that big task? Mm hmm to build this, you know, to build this big table or bed frame, get smart with these little, you know, these little things that you can get together. And once you put all together, you got this big thing. moving. Mm -hmm. um, and I was listening to uh, one of my buddies talk about, he went on this bike trip out in Costa Rica and they, you know, just Googled something like, Oh, hit up, the, you know, bike trail or whatever. Well, it turns out it's, I forget the name of it, but it, I guess it's something for you know, experienced mountain yeah. bike riders, like professionals go out there and ride this. So as you can probably imagine, they're not prepared. Um, so they get to the end and it's just this steady in, in our um, incline right up all the way. And people, and he told him, he's like, Hey, don't stop. Don't stop riding. If you get off, you're going to lose momentum and you're going to have to walk up this mountain or this, you know, this incline. And I was sitting there thinking, I mean, that that's life. That's in everything that we do. When you have that momentum, whether if it's hard, it's easy, whatever. If you get once you get off, that momentum stops. Right. And so now you have to pick that back up when you already have the systems, the process, everything going. Ride that. Continue doing what you're doing. Even if you stumble a little bit, you already have that momentum. Keep it rolling. Cause like, as soon as you get off that bike or that horse, whatever you want to call it, you got to pick that momentum back up. And it's so much harder to get that going again. Yeah. I think of in the context of a sales gig, like I'll set up call blocks and I'll, it takes me two or three to get going. Like, of course I'm leaving voicemails. I might get someone yeah. on the first three, but generally I don't have direct numbers. So it's like, I'm just doing the best I can to make my 10 dials in that hour. Yeah. It takes like five or six before I feel like I have my track down. And yeah. then when I do, when I am on my fifth or sixth and I get someone on or I get the gatekeeper and I'm trying to like get past them, I actually have, it's, it's almost like an energy. It's like an optimism. If I yeah. can leave these voicemails successfully, right. If I can, if I can get past one gatekeeper, I can get past another one. I, you know, so yeah. there's probably something to be said for like me spending my time the best it could be and not mm -hmm. making 10 calls. But that's the situation where I, I can immediately see the momentum as my friend, um, in making those 10 calls, like I wouldn't just make three. I always feel like I need to have a big enough sample set of numbers to dial in that, in that call block yep. to make it worth my time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I've been doing of late, um, you know, kind of with, with my, I call them buckets, you know, my outreaches, you know, so I've gotten LinkedIn outreach emails, you know, I might do like a handwritten note, um, phone calls, obviously, and then video messages. Um, so I do have a tangible number that I want to do for the day or well, mainly for the week. And I break it up um, with dials. You know, I, I really compare that to going out into the in, into my game, you know, like like it's game time. Right. Because if you get I'm calling C-level people. So if I get them on the phone it's we're going right and yeah. the chances of me getting them on the phone are very slim and yep. if i and if I, they're probably slim to none if i get them can get them on the phone again um so what i've been doing of late is i mean shouldn't say of late what i got back to doing was role playing before because just like you were before a game you, you know do your warm-up shots you know do your little like drills whatever it is so when you go in the game it's not, a, it's not practice anymore. You're already warmed up. You're ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's helped me a lot to, you know, find that groove a lot quicker mm -hmm. or in this, you know, in this say my momentum, get that going. And then, yeah, you get a couple people on the phone you're smiling, you're up, you're moving, you know, that's a good feeling, you know? Yeah. I think of the professional athletes you talked about, um, 
those folks who were like doing the same thing over and over again. Like I just got back from playing basketball and I didn't have the best shooting day. Like some days I'm like everything I shoot is going in. Uh, and I didn't have like my practice in the beginning, like I normally do. I, I got there a little later and I just, it, hard, it was hard for me to get my momentum on my threes. Yeah. And, uh, like the best shooters I know it's the same motion, like down to like yeah. where the, where the pinky follows through every yeah. single time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah. Cause I mean, you, you grew up playing sports. I mean, you probably had, you know, some, something on the side outside of, you know, your AAU or your, yeah. college, your high school team or your college team, you were doing something on the side. You're either shooting with somebody or you're going to a coach, you know, if you're not doing that same stuff outside of your professional job to get better at it, but you're doing this growing up to play basketball, then I don't think that you truly val like value your profession. And, and I don't mean that by any means to anyone that's not doing it. Cause I'm, I'm not doing it right now, but I'm about to, I mean, I, I listen to podcasts, read books, you know, do stuff like that. But, um, I think you got to invest in, in your profession because that's how you get better. That's how you become a professional because when you practice, you know, your scripts, your emails, you're just talking to people, it's now second nature and you're not practicing when you are talking to that individual that you're trying to set a meeting with, you know? Yeah. What do your role plays look like for the call, the call? Yeah. So if I don't have anybody in the office, I just sit there and look in the mirror. Yeah. Um, and just, and I just say my opener as many times as I can until it feels natural again, um, which is pretty simple. It's like, Hey, Hey, Nick, Nick with insperity here. I know I caught you at a bad time, but you got five minutes or not five minutes. Do you have 30 seconds for me to explain why I'm calling? And nine times out of 10, it's, yeah, sure. You got 30 seconds, you know, then I go into it. Um, I think if you can practice, you know, each section of your call or whatever you're doing, and break it up in chunks and then you put it all together mm -hmm. you're, you're, it's going to be more fluid coming out of your mouth yeah i like what you said about like saying it until you can until it sounds natural because like what i'll do if i have a deck like a presentation before a, a big you know sales like call the parts that i don't practice I found that I, oh, I got this. It's all good. Like I've, I've done that a million times. I, I kind of blank it. Like I, I'm like, damn, like if I only, like in the moment, I'm like, fuck, like I'm, I'm blanking right now. Like, <laughs> oh, that is, that's the use case. It takes yeah. me a second. And the first slide, if that's never happened to them. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the parts that I did like practice over and over again, cause it's new information or it's things I, I don't know quite as well. I, I crush that stuff. Cause I've, I like, even just as dumb as, mouthing the words that you're going to say like it's it's not yeah. dumb it's super important to do that oh yeah you have to you absolutely have to yeah so momentum man it's it's big i mean i think of i do think in that moment on the hill i'd be the kind of person that would be like well i'm super tired now so i'm gonna like chill for five minutes get my heart rate back to like where it should be <laughs> and then try to get back on but i know what you're saying about about like maybe maybe I don't ride quite as hard or five minutes after that I'm like oh I'm tired again I'm gonna chill like you know what I mean yeah when you give yourself that little <laughs> mm -hmm. that little ledge you might just hop on off it again yeah I mean of course take take breaks when you can um you know like you know you don't want to burn yourself out and what you're doing um you know you want to you know definitely want to work smarter not harder for sure for sure man um Anything else with momentum you wanted to cover? Cause it's, it's, I do believe that like life there's patterns and when something keeps coming up, there's like a reason for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm really big in momentum. I'm really big in, um, you know, like manifesting something Yeah. or just like, and I think that's, you know, whether it, if you got a goal, you know, make that be front and center of, of your life, you know, like write it down, have a picture of whatever it is. Like we're, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're planning on going to Croatia, um, Labor Day weekend. And I mean, that's been a goal of mine. So it's the uh, background screen of my computer. Um, I've got a, just a sign that says Croatia. Um, Cause like, 
we can, I can get all of our flights, everything going today financially, but I want to go there and actually spend money, you know, and not have to worry about a budget and be comfortable, you know? So that's something that is a tangible goal that I have in place this year. So that is front and center of my life. And I talk about it. So the more I talk about it, the more I see it, my actions are working towards it, whether I know it or not, you know? Yeah. You're the second person that's mentioned manifesting to me. Someone else said like, why don't you manifest this? And it was like three months ago. And I thought about it and I, here I am not doing it. Um, but today I thought about that again, like, uh, it's like affirming, right? So whatever I want, I'm going to say it or think it, or at least have a pattern, which on my screensaver something, right? Yeah. Um, so I like what you said about that. And again, with the pattern, like you're the first person that said it in the last four months, but like, there's still, you're, you're not the only, like, I've seen that on TikTok too. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. get on motivation talk sometimes. <laughs> I, need to, I need to get a TikTok. I hear nothing but good things about it. It's, it's a time waster. I know how you like to wait, spend your time, but uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, I don't, I don't know of another platform that somehow gets what you want to see so well. It's like really, um, it's kind of like rough, really hard takes at stuff. But a lot of times, especially with personal development, it's kind of like the no nonsense people that are saying like the really true stuff. And um, Gary V's of the world type stuff. Well, and they make fun of him, but like yeah. <laughs> the Jocko Willings and the even like you and I talking about like giving yourself that ledge to not stop. I think there's a way to be compassionate with yourself. Yep. And not be so hard on yourself, but also recognize if I get off here, like I'm giving myself an easy out. Yeah. And, and almost like accepting that that's what you're doing in that moment. And if you want to fall on that sword, okay. But like right now, I'm giving myself an easy out and I'm going to choose to do that. I know that like, if that happens in a, in a game sports or whatever, and I lose, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. You're like, you are your toughest critic, you know, at the end of the yeah. day. And so every day you got to look yourself in the mirror and say like, you know, did I get better? Did I slack off? Mm -hmm. You know, I think I like whether you're actually doing that or not, but like, I, I think that's a good exercise that, people should talk to themselves, you know, be like, listen to yourself, talk to yourself and hold yourself accountable. You know that, I mean, don't do that in person, yeah. walk around the streets. I mean, mm -hmm. but like before you go to bed or write in a journal or something, mm -hmm. just have a conversation with yourself. Yeah. Even like you're doing now, like you're keeping it light. You're kind of laughing at yourself, like recognize that it's ridiculous, but do it anyway. Right. Like, right. <laughs> oh, like when you told the story about the trash, like I just started laughing because I imagined myself in that moment, like, you know what? Like I'm, I'm going to take, take this piece of trash up right now. And it's like, it's funny. Cause I like, I, yeah. I probably wouldn't do it, but I'm imagining myself in that situation. And it's, you know, like, you know, it's the right thing. And it's almost like a skit from like, you know, Chappelle show, you turn around <laughs> that fucking trash is sitting there, like staring at you. you <laughs> yeah. I'm going to walk away, but like, you know, yeah. you're going to start noticing it now. Yeah. And now you're going to have, you're going to, you're going to question, should I just pick this up or not? <laughs> but like, yeah, keep it light. Walk into the mirror. Ow, now, brown cow, you know, <laughs> and then it's, <laughs> then it's your, your, your company, then it's your script. Then it's your, you know, like 30 second pitch, right? It's so there's a way to keep it light and just have fun with your life, you know, like keep life yeah. light. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this podcast I listen to, I'll throw a little shout out. It's called mm -hmm. Blissful Prospecting. Yep. Um, the guy is Jason Bay is the, uh, the creator of it. Yep. Um, so it's all about, have you, have you heard of it? Yeah, I have. I, I feel like I've connected with Jason on LinkedIn too. Okay. Yeah. I think his content's really good if you're a sales professional, cause it's, he's really humanizes the, I think the profession, right. And, and, uh, and how to, you know, talk to people you're trying to get in touch with, but, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought, but he was talking about, um, keep it light, you know, when you're talking yeah. to those people, because you're having a conversation, you know, you can make fun of yourself. You can laugh at your own jokes. You can um, be vulnerable. You know, I think that's, you know, that those are just, you know, just be, just be real. I think at the end of the day is what, as a self-professional, that's, that's an advice that I can, if I can give anybody without get, being too complex and talking about frameworks and tactical yeah. stuff, I think, just be a human and just be real. I think that's that yeah. take you a long way in that in a sales professional or in fact any profession, I think.
Yeah, that, that was one thing that came out almost immediately in our conversation with, with the panel was just the importance of being human and being real. Yeah. And I switching it around, like I find that when I do feel anxiety or when I feel uh, worried about a call or my one-on-one with my manager, it's because I'm withholding information that I know is my truth, right? But I'm not saying it or I'm not, I'm not being real, right? Like yeah. if I don't think a deal is qualified, but I'm acting like it is in my pipeline, you know what I mean? That leads yeah, to yeah. more insecurity and not lies, but it leads to more half truths and it'll come back to bite me. So it's like, okay, I don't have the pipeline I need. I recognize it's an issue. This deal is not qualified. Let's make a plan to create more pipeline that is real. You know, like that's a better conversation than to just like kind of put it down the the year and, and, and the quarters. Yeah. Cause then you're not, you're not getting better. Right. So I was, and I just thought of this. So like, if I put in 10 fluff, you know, leads or, or, you know, things that could, or opportunities that look like they're moving in the pipeline report versus one quality one. And my manager says like, all right, cool. What's the next steps with here? What do you think? And I'm like, yeah, I could move. I'm like being very optimistic, but I know deep down that they're not going anywhere mm-hmm. versus this one quality one compared to the guy next door that has 10, you know, fake fluff ones. We could sell this one. It might move through, but then we're going to have an action plan on how to get nine more, just like that one, you know? So when these 10 don't move on the other one on option, or, you know, the first guy and we're like hitting the manager and themselves like, well, what happened here? And then you have to come up with this story as what happened and whatnot. You just lost all that time to be better and get everything moving in the right direction. So, yeah, I think that's a good point, man. Like, just be real. <laughs> and like your manager is there to help you get better and get those qualified opportunities in there to move across the uh, finish line. Yeah. I think there's a certain humility that this whole mindset takes too. Cause I could sit here and like my, my ego brain says, you've been in sales 10 years, you've sold this, this many deals, you've sold this many large deals. You didn't do this. Like, it's almost like there's like the devil on your shoulder too. <laughs> saying like You don't need to be doing this. Right. Right. But I know that slowing down, creating an action plan, you know, talking about real pipeline versus not real. I know that's the right thing to do. I know that that's me getting better. And it takes me to say, I'm not everything I possibly could be right now. And it's going to take some hard work to get better. Um, I know that's the right thing to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because I think that if you are, you know, it goes back to if you're not doing, if you're doing the wrong thing, you know, it's going to be exhausting uh, and that ego comes into play. You're like, I basically, I feel like a lot of people fluff up their pipeline so that they're, they get their manager off their back, you know, essentially, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, I don't know what their manager's like, but if they're a good manager, I'll say it again, they're there to help you. You know, they're, if they're criticizing you and that's the only reason you're, you're, you're fluffing up the pipeline, then that's a, that's a totally different conversation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's important in sales to have a good frontline manager, you know, cause you yeah. need to have a certain level of trust where yeah. you can, you can be vulnerable and recognize that there's work to do. And I would hope that this, the managers recognizes that you might have a different, you know, perspective than them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause you know, like if, let's say that they don't think it is qualified or, you know, hopefully there's some sort of a schema or policy for how it's qualified and it's yes yeah. or no, but like there are, there are gray areas. Like I feel really good about this one. I have five or six of these questions answered, but not these two. And they, they might say, yeah, like this is something you might want to figure out. Hey, I, I should figure that out, but this is a real deal, right? Like I'm putting myself in the context of a conversation yeah, that might happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's like, I mean, I'm thinking about, I'm looking at, I'm thinking about my pipeline right now and, you know, I've got maybe three or four that can actually, you know, mm-hmm. make some, you know, probably become a client of mine, but there's some other ones in there that I still need to, you know, create, you know, like qualify them, you know, get some more meetings on the board there before I can actually start talking about this being a real opportunity for them to become a client. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I've seen where, you know, I've worked with somebody where, 
they were fluffing a lot of stuff and, you know, not asking for the help that they needed and they were gone. You know, I think if you can be transparent with your leadership and your, and your coaches and your mentors, um, that's, that's going to bring, that's going to be bring back so much value to you because they're going to, they're there to teach you. They're there to help you. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the other guys that works at your company, I, I talked to him last week and, um, you know, like everyone has good years and bad years, but kind of curious when you talk about momentum or consistency, what do you do when you are having maybe not the best week or the best month? Like you just said, people fluff their pipeline up to get their manager off their back. Even in that moment, that takes some balls to be like, I'm going to just stay the course, not create artificial pipeline, you know, not make myself feel better artificially and just work my process, you know, kind of, it's an open question, but curious how you do that. Yeah. I mean, what you just said at the end is, you know, what you got to keep doing. Like if you've been successful, you know, with what you're doing today, continue it. Um, you know, I think it goes back to that being a professional. Um, what I learned at, you know, playing minor league ball, they, they would have bad games, a streak of them, but they were doing the same thing every day. Didn't matter if they mm-hmm. went over four or four for four. It was the same thing. I mean, they might have, you know, changed something up mentally, but routine wise, it was the same thing. And I think that's, you got to stick to it. Um, and of course you tweak a little bit here and there. And I think that's, you know, that's the beauty of being in a profession like ours. You, you're allowed to be creative and, you know, try new things out, but you got to have a core structured process that keeps you on task and keeps you moving. Um, and I think, yeah, you're going to have bad games. You're going to have bad weeks. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have a bad month, maybe in a bad quarter. Bad quarter, you might need to go back to the drawing board. But, you know, um, you got to stick to your process 100%. Yeah. I, I closed a deal uh, yesterday, I'm mean, so Friday. And I thought, yeah. hey, this is great. Thank you. But I'm like, I'm, I've almost like turned my, told myself to not get big on it. Like, don't get a big head. Cause it, you know, first of all, it's small, but even if it was big, like I got a lot of room to go before I hit my quota, you know? Yeah. And I think there's another, another way to look at it too. Like when you're so down, when you're not hitting your number or things basically when outcomes aren't, aren't happening that are good, right. Yeah. Stay even keeled. And then when things are happening that are really good, be patient, be reasonable, you know, be, be, be even humble. keeled and be yeah. humble. Yeah. Like, you know, I recognize that it was a kind of a flip of a deal. Don't sell yourself short and be like, Hey, it was easy. Right. Cause it wasn't, but be ready to pick the phone back up <laughs> you know, and yeah. be ready. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I, I think when you're, when you stick to a process and you're putting the work in luck, luck happens. Mm-hmm. You know? It's cause it's all the work that you're doing um, that leads up to that moment you know, whether it was an easy win, an easy sell, or it was a hard one, like the same work happened there. It it just something that might've been harder to get this one. It was a lot easier, but I think people say like you create your own luck. And I think you create your own luck by the work that you're putting in and the discipline that you have to stick on a routine and a process, you know? Yeah. This is a really helpful conversation, man. Thank you for just listening to, because like, you can see that I'm, I'm thinking about this shit all day and like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to always get better, but also recognize like I can be proud of myself too. So it's, you know, it's, it's good to talk to another, another winner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm trying <laughs> a couple minutes ago, you mentioned like, okay, I'm thinking about my pipeline. Let's not talk about that at all. Like when you want to forget about work, like I, I know that you're big into music. I know you spend a little bit, you and I both love house music. Yeah. How do you use music within your day to day? to be more effective or to just forget about, about work? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, Hmm. I don't know if I really escape work with music. Um, cause it's funny. Cause like, since I do DJ, um, I'm always, I'm listening and I, and I say DJ, like, I mean, I definitely, you know, played some events and some how and parties, but it's, yeah, definitely a hobby type of thing. But I'm whenever I listen to songs, I'm listening for the fact that I can play it later, <laughs> you know. Um, and so when I go through buying my my tracks, 
it's like a three or two hour ordeal. Um, cause I, I like a bunch of tracks on either Spotify or, or SoundCloud and I go through and listen to them again. I'm like, okay, are they worthy for me to buy and download? And then I go and test them out and then I play. Um, but I'd say, uh, you know, on weekends going to concerts and, you know, doing new, like tra- checking out new venues or new bands or DJs, I'd say, yeah, that's where I escape work because, I'm not talking work there. I'm kind of plugging into the atmosphere, the environment, and, you know, listening to what they're doing, uh, what the sound's like. So, yeah, I'd say I escape that way when it comes to my music and, and what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, I, I just was the one who said escape. You might not have to think of it that way at all. I almost think of it as a way to get out of my own head. Like, yeah. I love the repetitive four by four beats of house music. It yep. creates this like pattern and consistency, like where I just know that next bar is coming or if there's some melody or like synth in there, I know it's coming. And like, it creates this like lightness that, yeah. you know, if I'm doing something where I don't need to be on, on video or like, you know, on the phone, I'm doing something admin, it, it kind of creates like a pep in my step. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and that, that's, that going. <laughs> some people don't understand house um, and I don't necessarily blame them. Like, but to me, it's my favorite kind of music because it, it samples R and B. So it's like there's that classic, like amazing vocal a lot of the time, but it's sped up. And then these producers know how to add synth and reverb and everything to it. And it's yep. it's I mean tech house, deep house, um, melodic house. Those are some of my All favorites. House. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. There's progressive. There's dubstep. Right, like that's not really yeah. me. Um, but everyone has a, has a different flavor for it. Like when I listen to something deep or something melodic, that's like more the calm motions. That's more like the creative side. Um, when I need to just like chill the fuck out and like stop worrying or thinking so much, I put on like some Chris Lake, (laughs) just like bump, 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 (laughs) you know, you will freak. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll just like start dancing here on my kitchen Island. You just like, and it, it gets me out of my, my slump and it's like, okay, just a call, yeah. just a sales job, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. Um, yeah. I mean, I was listening to house music on the way here, man, uh, on the way home. Uh, I think music, man, is just, I mean, what would life be without it? <laughs> you know, like, I think, yeah, I don't, I can't even imagine it. Like you're, you're naturally going to there's music. I don't know. Music is just naturally going to happen. Like, I mean, if you go back to the caveman, I'm sure they're just banging on the rock or yeah. whatever it was. And they put a little rhythm to it. And the next thing you know, it's a song, you know, um, and they forgot about all their bad stuff that's gone on their day that day. And they're having a good time mm-hmm. dancing on the fires. You know, now we're doing the same thing. We're just dancing around a bunch of light shows and, you know, different yeah. stuff, you know, so yeah, man, I think music is an awesome place to just let your mind just not do anything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's no surprise that, you know, people for centuries have been liking music. And I mean, I was talking about just the weight of work and the weight of holding yourself accountable, right? Like there are things that exist out there that we humans are naturally going to, you know, tend toward. And yeah. I think music's one of them. Like people that don't like music, I, I don't un- understand it. <laughs> people, I don't think I've ever known met anybody that says they don't like music. Have you? I've met people who say like, Hey, I'm just not that into music or like they, they don't, they like everything. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah you I've no, definitely those people for sure. Yeah. S- some people say they have like no preference and I, I get it. Maybe you're, you're not trying to like download songs and play them <laughs> for people. Right. I, right. First of all, I like that too, because what you're doing is you're investing in that in that song. And you're even if it's just a dollar, two dollars, you're investing in the possibility that you might play it. And then right. when you're practicing, you're investing that time. So when you actually are at the house party and you're spinning, right? And you drop that, you know that transition is going to be dope. Like you know, right. people are going to like, and I've done it too. Like there's this one, um, this this artist from Italy. I practiced and practiced and practiced. I knew it was going to be wild when I played this. And it was like, I'm not, I'm a novice. And people were like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. knew that I knew it when it, when it was going to drop, it was going to, you know, blow people's minds. Cause it was like a deep Thank house cut. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So that's cool. Um, just about music and investing in, in the moments and even with a little bit of, of your, of your money. 
Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I love it, man. It's, uh, it's fun. I think everybody should definitely dabble. If, if anybody watching or listening, I think that if you are the one on the ox cord queuing up songs, you are a DJ, whether you know it or not, you are, you're a DJ because you're curating a vibe yep. and you're putting the right tracks in order that, that just go well. Yeah. I had someone I met last week say, I swear the, the D they were just putting on a Spotify playlist. <laughs> and that was a fun, because there's so many shows like this weekend's camel fat after that is expansions, you know, like, and I go to these shows. I know a lot of people in this scene, they're like, Hey, come to this, come to that. I'm like, I can't go to everything, you know, no. but I do think about like, there are some shows where it's like, that was totally skippable. <laughs> like oh, yeah. that was completely just like their top five on Spotify played <sighs> for an hour and a half. I bought like four beers and like, <laughs> what, yeah. what was the point? Like I could have just stayed home and like gone to Eric Prids next weekend, like someone who cares. <laughs> yeah, know? man. It's, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. I was actually having this conversation with somebody recently and, and they were asking me who I like to see, what I like to go to. And I go, man, I really appreciate a good artist and a, you know, DJ. So like just good, like house music. Right. And I'm not going to say the artists and who they said, but I remember thinking, I was like, man, I've heard that plenty of times. Man, if I really want to go see them, I'll go, I'll, throw on the radio you know type of thing i need i need something that's gonna be creative you know outside the box not standard stuff that you can just play your on your spotify and just let it mix out right um but i do i do envy the people that can go to all those things and have a blast because now when i go like you said if it's not good and it just feels like i'm on spotify i'm listening on spotify I'm kind of like smogged about it. You know, I'm just like very, eh, I can, I yeah. can do, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to leave and, yeah. I, and I see everybody having a good time and, you know, dancing uh, and just like, I'm the guy in the corner, like this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, real recognize real. If you can actually DJ and like know how to mix, you know what it is. I mean, that same with sales. Like if I see, if I see someone doing it really bad, I almost just have to exit out of like the presentation. <laughs> it's like oh, painful. Yeah. Or it's like, oh, can you not ask me what my, what my biggest pain is right now? <laughs> right. What, 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 is, <laughs> what is what is the urgency event? <laughs> yeah. like, what's your what's your budget? Like what like the, I mean, when I hear that stuff, man, like if they had the budget for you, they would have called you and ready to buy. Like, no, like. I was listening. To, I was listening to podcast today, and it was this guy's on Zoom and phone. The guy goes, "I think it, what Bant is like the yeah. the thing, yeah, yeah, Bant, yeah." Um, he goes, "Man, I hate it." Um, they, I guess they have like a sign in there, like with the sales office. It was like, no one has the budget for Zoom info. <laughs> <laughs> no one's got it, but go get, go get your sales right. So, yeah, which is, I'm gonna elaborate on that. If you create enough value with somebody, yes, and they're then they see that there's value for them and their company. It's going to help them do solve you know X Y Z problems or whatever. They will make a budget for it. They'll find it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> they'll find yeah. the money. I, I don't even try to. I don't think I've ever asked that. Like maybe when I was in, if you're selling like a commodity like printers or you know if you're trying to unseat a competitor, there's questions around like what are you currently spending. When does yeah. your contract end? That kind of stuff that might clue it in. But, you know, it's this idea of like, what is, that's like this role of sales like to create, to create this, the story and the pain, right. To, yeah. help, to help them see the pain and how it could be. So like, when I think of band, I think of like authority need time. I think authority matters. You got to have a path to that if you don't. Yeah. I think need is kind of loose. Like I like medic a lot more because it talks about, a champion it talks about um creating like a, a pain yeah um need is only half the equation they can need it but the cost to switch might not be enough to like constitute the next call yep you know what i mean yep. like if you get yep. that ceo on you get one shot of course they need what you guys are selling right but mm -hmm. is it worth another call with you 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 have to create that urgency that's your right. job right, right. absolutely and, and so when I think of need, I think of need slash urgency as like one letter. 
timeline that that you can if you create enough value that gets expedited to this quarter if you want it to right if you do yeah. your work well enough and then budget if you if you do your your work you are the one that creates the budget so i don't know if if, if you have the right accounts and you have the right methodology bant is you can almost like <laughs> qualify anything if you do the if you do your your job correctly yeah yeah i I haven't, I haven't looked in the band. I've heard people talk about it, but like just the fact that leads with budget, like I'm already, like, I'm not going to look into it anymore, I'm, but I'm sure there's some good stuff to take out of it. Like just like anything, but there's just so much other stuff that I resonate with that I think really, you know, matches, or at least how I want to, how I view how I, my processes are. Right. So yeah, I find all that stuff very interesting. Right on. Well, just kind of closing up here. You mentioned Croatia. Do you have any other, you know, two, three year plan goals down the road that you're thinking about or, and how, how do you, how do you think about those long-term goals? Yeah. Um, it's well, I'll, I can tell you what they are. So, um, marry my girlfriend, you know, put the ring on it. Um, and then in three years is to buy a, either a two flat or a condo um and then hopefully we upgrade and that can turn into an uh an asset where we're renting that out doing airbnb so um i'd say that's more of a two to five year plan um all together so very very for uh looking forward to that but um yeah i think that's yeah. you know, those are the plans good for you i think that for us salespeople, real estate's a very natural thing to get into yeah. First of all, it's just smart, you know, because you're able to create an asset out of something that you, that, that was a liability. But second, yeah. we get these big chunks of money if we do our job well, right? And it's like, you could just blow that or save it and put it in something more, a different investment. But yeah. if you can put it in real estate, okay, it's locked in something that is pretty stable, right? Some some would have some opinions on this market, but, um, you know, if you can create enough capital to have a down payment and you truly want to do the work or hire a manager to do the the physical work yeah it's a pretty safe and sound investment yeah man outsource all that stuff man i i uh i know somebody that's got investment or they have houses but they do all the work and they only have one person living in one of them because the other places need work so it's those are liabilities to them at this moment so I don't own any homes, but if just based on what I know and what I've seen, outsource that stuff, you know, find a handyman, find someone that can you know, be a landlord, you know, or be the manager of your properties and then just find people that can, that will do a good job to get the work done. And you're good because it might cost a little bit of money to do this, invest in, but you're going to have people in there getting the money back, you know, versus it just being vacant and you got to do your cares on it. Monthly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like you you're already on a on a head start with reading about how you want to do it. And do you know what, what part of the city or what part of any city you want to invest in or where you want to live? Yeah. Um, so definitely here on the west side, I would like to have, you know, my home or like my two flat. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, if you look at Chicago real estate, that stuff just keeps sprawling out, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm in Logan Square. I don't think I'll ever leave. Um, but as for you know, different states love Michigan and love Indiana mm -hmm. from Indiana. I mean, no, that's, it's yeah. just honestly, look, hold on. The fact that I met you at a networking group and we talked and we get to talking a little bit more and I know that you're only a couple years older than me at that. And we went, grew up in the same part of town. Yeah. With some of the same people, like mind blown to me. Like, how do we not talk about this? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I think you and I speak a lot of the same language just naturally, just kind yeah. of where we're raised and stuff. But yeah, I mean, there's, I can go on and on about Cathedral or IU, yeah. um, some of the, some of the athletes I know. Yeah. Sounds like we all got a lot of the same friends. The house parties, you know, all that stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I can see myself, uh, you know, investing in some properties out in uh, Indy, you know, very excited uh, for that growth. And I mean, hell, it's probably like 30% cheaper to live there than it is in Chicago. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, I'm I'm really into modern work and how things are going to shake out. I think that person to person matters, but I don't know that things will ever going to be the same. Um, no, no, not at all. A lot of these tech companies that you and I work—I mean, I know I work for a tech company. You have, you have a sales job, right? So it's we're on Zoom a lot. We're on the phone a lot, right? Yeah. It's not like we're in a physical office. We're not, you know, doctors go go to the same hospital every day. Um, I don't know that 
there's a reason that you wouldn't consider cheaper markets once you have your life set up and you want to build wealth. Right. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I choose to want to be in Chicago. I love it here. I love the restaurants, love the scene, love the people. Yeah, just people speak to me here, but um, yeah, yep. I, we're going to see how this, how this all shakes out. And there's no reason that you shouldn't have, you know, multiple places eventually, if you, you know, if you ex execute your plan and figure out a way to, uh, to do it. Yeah. Um, I agree with that hundred percent. I think, uh, one trend that I'm, what I think is going to kind of blow up is that multi ownership of real estate, you know, like I'm sure you probably know some families that have, you know, split a lake house, you know, split a, um, you know, winter home somewhere or beach home. I think you're going to start seeing that with just different places. Um, like, cause I've already been talking about it. Like, Hey, you know, a cousin of mine, we might split a condo in Miami just so that, cause we're able to work, we're able to do these virtual calls. You know, we don't have to be in Chicago or, you know, for his sake in Atlanta, um, to do their work. They, we can be all over. So he gets, you know, if he wants to be here this month, cool, he's got it. Then I can do it next month. And then if we're not there, we can rent it out Airbnb. And now we're just splitting everything. I think I can see that being a trend. I don't know the industry and everything, but I can see that, you know, kind of moving forward. Yeah. It's like a timeshare, but with right. people that you know. <laughs> right. And you're not locked into something. I don't even know how timeshares work, but I hear they're a night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure, man. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Let's yeah, uh, let's, let's get a beer sometime soon. Of course. I mean, I'll see you this week in expansions. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, man. See you there. All right, man. Have a good one. Bye.